pessoal. Bem-vindos a mais uma série de conferências virtuais da PUC Minas. A disciplina de seminários 1, 2 e 3 é realizada de, é, é, é realizada de forma integrada entre as unidades do Coração Carístico e da Praça da Liberdade, sendo que essa integração vai ser adotada para futuros eventos presenciais. Devido à pandemia da Covid-19, a universidade optou pela realização das conferências em formato virtual para resguardar o, os, os professores, os funcionários e os, os estudantes e os, convida, e os convidados desse evento. Hoje, a nossa palestra conta com a possibilidade de interpretação, de tradução simultânea. Vocês podem achar um botão escrito é, português, inglês, off, ele está... Ele é o terceiro botão, da, da direita para a esquerda, tem o botão End, More, Reactions e a possibilidade de vocês verem a tradução simultânea desse evento. Para apresentar o nosso convidado de hoje, passo a palavra pelo responsável pela internacionalização do curso de arquitetura e urbanismo, professor Diogo Carvalho. Muito obrigado, boa palestra a todos. Então, Christoph é na hora técnica, ele é professor sênior da de Humanidades da Universidade de Sheffield, no Reino Unido, diretor do Programa de Pós-Graduação de Grupo de Pesquisa Espaço e Político, é, é também fundador e coordenador da Rede de Pesquisa de Arquitetura Pós-Secular. É, o Christoph, ele, ele, a, a ideia dele é ser quase brasileiro. aí, né? No ano passado, nós tivemos, é, nós nos conhecemos aqui em Belo Horizonte, e ele conheceu a nossa universidade, achou fenomenal e aceitou um convite né, de fazer parte, né, de inaugurar né, o nosso programa de professor visitante, que ia acontecer em março né, desse ano, né, mas devido à pandemia, a gente teve que adiar essa, essa possibilidade. Né? No entanto, né, a gente conseguiu né, é, né, ter essa oportunidade da palestra dele aqui e a gente espera... Né, que, que né, quando as coisas se acalmarem, né, o Cristo possa nos visitar aqui, ficar um tempo conosco né, para desenvolver as atividades com o é, Cristo, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for being here and accepting our invitation. Please. Ok. Um... Thank you very much for for invitation and thank you very much for uh, well, allowing me to to be here. As uh, as Diogo said, uh, um, in uh, the, our plans were slightly different. Uh, I was uh, planning to be in uh, in Belo Horizonte from uh, from April, um, but well, pandemic happened, so it was impossible. Uh, but I still hope that I will be able to uh, to join uh, join you and be in in, in Brazil uh, next year. Hopefully, everything will will be better. Um, to some extent, I'm I'm still there. Um, there was uh, colleagues. Uh, I think that some of them are part of audience today, uh, who are working with me on uh, projects. Um, research projects on um, on Brazilian Pentecostal churches and, and spaces used by, by Pentecostal uh, members of Pentecostal Pentecostal movement. So, you know, I'm, I'm still somehow, at least, you know, in my spirit, uh, I'm, I'm still in, in Brazil, but, you know, in flesh, hopefully it will happen next year. Um, today, uh, I'm, I'm going to, just give me a second, I will try to make this uh, as it should be. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think it's coming. Yeah, so I hope that you, you see the, the screen. And um, what, I'm, what I'm going to, to do today, I'm going to, to provoke you, to be honest. Uh, so, um, I'm going to talk about public space, but in a very critical way. 
So this distinction between public space and private space is something that uh, all architects and architecture students uh, across the world are, are using. Uh, this is a kind of common typology that uh, it's, uh, it's used in all, almost any, any place in the, in the world. And what I'm planning to do today, I'm planning to put arguments in front of you to stop doing it. So my argument is that the, the public space is uh, is uh, is recurring. is is a um, term that uh, it's uh, it's not helping. It's rather uh, obscuring what uh, what we see when we talk about about the space. So as I said, my my argument, my provocation is to to stop talking about public space at all and uh, to try to uh, replace it by, by something, something big. And now I need to find a way how I can move from slide to slide. Okay, I think that I'm, I know how to do this. Okay, um, sorry. So this is just you know, a very short introduction. Uh, Diogo already did it, so you know more or less uh, what I'm doing. Uh, if uh, anybody would be interested, there's a few books that I have published. Um, you know, I, I strongly recommend you not to try to buy them because especially uh, the, the, the last two ones on Kuala Lumpur and Total Urban Mobilization as academic books, they are pretty expensive. Um, so uh, I'm pretty sure that as you know, skillful young people, you are able to find them in a library or in, in other places if you would be interested to, to read them. But only if you, if you find my, uh, my talk, my lecture today uh, interesting. So the structure of the lecture is uh, relatively simple. I will start talking about space in general, um, then public space, the commons, infrastructure, and on the end, uh, I would like to talk a little bit uh, about decolonization because part of argument that I'm putting in front of you today is that uh, public space is a Western concept and uh, it's, it's useless uh, beyond uh, Europe, beyond the Western world. So this, uh, this discussion about decolonization is a part kind of supporting my argument to stop using uh, public space as an as idea, as a term at all. So starting with uh, with space as such, I, I understand that this is an extremely broad topic, and you would, you will need probably to spend set set of, of of lectures to to discuss it properly. So you know, just uh, please please uh, forgive me being extremely brief, but I will just focus on what I believe in uh, in space is uh, is crucial, is essential. Uh, for the sake in the context of, of my lecture today. So space is hierarchical. There was uh, in a urban studies, there was uh, two terms that uh, they are related to space. One is uh, absolute space, which is kind of geometrical space according to Euclidean geometry. So this is the space that uh, could be measured relatively easily. Yeah? So the space that uh, when uh, we use uh, GPS yeah, defined by coordinates, this is absolute space. But uh, this is just a part of the story when we talk about space. Uh, sociologists and people dealing with, uh, with, uh, with space and cities for last, let's say 30 years at least, they're using uh, another term term relative space, which is recognizing the fact that space is a constructed, it's, it's not neutral really, it's not passive. Uh, the space is what exists between different actors being in space and acting in space. To make it, uh, you know, maybe slightly more uh, clear. Para torná-lo mais claro, eu vou mostrar para vocês alguns diagramas. 
Uh, eu vou fazê-lo somente usando a tela, porque normalmente nas palestras eu geralmente uh, me movo e mostro com o meu próprio corpo, o meu próprio movimento. Uh, dentro do cenário da palestra é mais fácil imaginar, uh, imaginar como e quando eu falo sobre espaço. Então vamos tentar fazer isso usando somente os slides. Então, como eu disse, o espaço é relativo. Uh, ele é sempre descrito... Our relationship to other actors, objects, people existing in space. Yeah, so you can you can imagine that you sit uh, uh, in your armchair or whatever you are, and this is your space A. And then there's a space B, where it's uh, I don't know, a kitchen uh, or living room or space uh, outside your window or another space that you can imagine. You can look. At. Okay, and if you think about space like that, then you see that there's a, always something in between, between space A and space B. There's a, always this space X. But, you know, let's let's uh, call it X. And the space X is has absolutely fundamental meaning because the space X is um, uh, é organizing. Organizado. It's um, controlling access from space A to B. Okay, give, give me a second. Okay, so there is a relationship. We can say there's a dialectical relationship between space A and, and B, uh, X and B. Yeah, so space X is controlling access from A to B, but in the same moment, uh, In the same moment, is it? Okay, uh, I'm just getting different information from different places, but I hope that you, you can hear me and everything is, is fine. So there is a relationship between space X and space B because it means that only if you really want to go to space B, the space X is important. Yeah, only if you want to cross the space X, the space B, uh, you know, will, will be achieved. So it means that space is hierarchical. It means there's a hierarchy of spaces. There's a discussion about power and accessibility is embedded in space as such. And what, what does it mean? It means that if we want to talk about space in any sense of justice and equality, it means that we need to deal with this uh, fact that space X is always between space A and B. And it means that the space X uh, is in a position of power. So those are two general ways how it could be done. And I'm using Nancy Fraser discussion about justice and injustice. Nancy Fraser is a pretty famous uh, feminist uh, philosopher, and she never used uh, this uh, this discussion into uh, into space. But I believe that what she was talking in more general terms and in terms of policy, uh, it's very easy to be transferred into uh, spatial discussion. Okay. So this is my interpretation of Nancy Fraser uh, discussion about, about uh, justice and injustice. So those are two main ways of, of doing this. So one is a kind of political way when you are applying external conditions and kind of forcing space X to allow access to space B, okay? Uh, so you know, if you imagine um, that you sit in your room 
and then there's another room between you and the kitchen okay and you would like to get to the kitchen through this another space and you know th that was just a common agreement in in your family on the place where, or place where you live that everybody can pass this this space x this this corridor or room between you and the kitchen but it could be blocked yeah because you know something like that so this is one way when you apply non-spatial conditions on space another way of dealing with injustice or this hierarchical obstacles that we have in space is something that Nancy Fraser called transformative strategy. And when it's translated into space, then it's, uh, it's relatively easy to imagine. Uh, if you ever use uh, underground metro, then uh, this is exactly what metro is doing. Yeah? Metro is not touching what is on the ground, it's just creating another route another dimension of accessibility okay so then if you can't go from a to b because there was a wall there was another district there's a, you know something that is blocking your access you just create another one yeah and as i said metro is uh, is a good example so this is just very brief introduction to uh, to fundamental problems that we, I believe, as architects or urbanists are dealing when we talk about space. In the same moment, we try to think about any kind of uh, emancipatory strategy or any, any type of creating more just, more equal world. Yeah? So this is the challenge that uh, we need to, to deal with. Now I would like to, to move to my main argument, to the argument that uh, public space uh, doesn't exist, or it's uh, so, you know, nebulous term that uh, to some extent I would say it exists. So in Western tradition, uh, public space uh, it's coming from the idea of the void. It, this is. I don't know if you recognize this. It's uh, it's a Noli plan from 18th century of Rome. Uh, the, the, okay, Daniel. And wall is uh, is based on the idea of the void. The void, the space in between, the gap between what is private, what is personal, and what belongs to the state. Okay. So this is discussion uh, that uh, Jürgen Habermas was uh, was using when he was talking about bourgeois public space, public sphere. So the space where the so-called civic society was starting to create, to kind of mediate between the personal interest and personal life and the state apparatus. This is a diagram. I don't know if you recognize this one. It's uh, Oscar Newman, uh, Newman uh, Defensible Space Theory uh, from the uh, beginning of 70s. I think the book was published 1971. And um, this is very um, simple description of this hierarchical um, spectrum from public space to private space. And again, if you look on this diagram uh, in the context of what I was talking about before, when I was talking about hierarchy of space, then you see clearly that uh, this theory, this, this discussion about uh, space, public, private, is this is the discussion about control and power. Okay, so from this this diagram, you can you can see that. Uh, the semi-public is controlling access to the next, to the, to the semi-private, and then it's controlling the access to, to private. So if you look on this diagram from the perspective of the hierarchical space, then you, you start to see that the whole discussion about public-private uh, in, in terms of, of, of space is extremely oppressive. It's really discussion about accessibility, who is controlling access, uh, who has a power to control access or has a power to allow you to, to enter. 
Okay, so this is this two elements that is a foundation for uh, European discussion or Western discussion about public space. One is a void that exists between personal and state, and then another one is control, power, accessibility. Okay, next one. So the discussion about public space and the term public space is uh, is very political, even if it's seen as it's, it's not. So there's a European uh, prize for public space. So every two years, um, all European countries are presenting what they have done, and uh, then the, the prize is, uh, is is given. And I will show you just one example from from Poland um, and with with some commentary okay so next slide okay next slide okay um, so it just to give you context is the center of uh, of the city there was a square and then there was a museum created but the museum was created kind of under the, the square. So this uh, this fault that you can see here, in fact, is a building, but the building exists below the square. Okay, so, you know, it's kind of typical architectural um, way of, of doing things. It looks cool, you know, on, the, on diagram, it looks so probably amazing. Um, but of course, when you look on, um, on this square, it looks pretty empty and sad, at least in my opinion. Okay, next slide. So now, now you see how this uh, uh, so-called public space uh, looks uh, in um, just you know common time, the, the any any day that it happens, and uh, you know if uh, there will be people related uh, to urban studies, urban analysis, then probably we'll start asking a question: Why it's so empty? Why people are not using this? What is the problem? What is the regulation? that's not allowing to people to, to use it. Is it physical problem? Is, uh, um, is a location of this, this place in the city? Yeah, so what, what are the, the, the reasons for, 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 you know, for this uh, place looking like, like it looks? And it's not my kind of mean way of presenting this. This, uh, this uh, photograph, this photo is uh, from uh, the, the website of, uh, of the institution giving the prizes. So it was the photo sent that you know people who nominate this space sent yeah? so this is the, the photo representing them being proud of of this space okay so I, we are not going to find an answer for for this question of course but it's it's important to start asking these questions and then we see that uh, the, the the space in city is much more complicated than it could uh, be seen and this is another uh, photo that i really like um, because then you see there's a queue, I'm guessing for the exhibition, because the building is a museum. So there's a queue for exhibition. And as you see, uh, the design uh, um, didn't predict the fact that, uh, well, Poland is not Brazil, but uh, it could be about 30 degree during summer uh, in, in sun. So people are hiding in the shadow to, uh, to avoid uh, the sun, to kind of protect themselves. Okay, so but at least you know there's more people here that uh, in the in the preview. Okay, next one. And then you have uh, you have London. Uh, you have different place, um, different uh, again so-called public space, which um, is focused on meditation on. Uh, being alone. So the, the public space, as uh, we very often discuss in architecture schools, as a place with uh, accessibility for everybody, a place where people meet each other, a uh, place of uh, engagement, uh, sometimes a place for political action. Um, this, this type of spaces are absolutely depoliticized. Deep but also they kind of 
I don't even know if uh, the, the walls like that exist, but I would say that they are uh, desocialized. Okay, so they they are not designed for public; they design for individual. Okay, so what is this um, discussion about uh, you know the the public space as a space for public? Is it really relevant to to spaces like like this? Okay, next one. And now I would like to leave uh, Europe for a moment and uh, to jump to, to China. This is, this is from, from a PhD project uh, that uh, my student is, is working. Uh, so it's, uh, it's her photograph. Um, and uh, the concept of public space in, in China is extremely new. It's, it kind of started to be present um, about 70 years ago, okay? So in a kind of traditional Chinese discussion about cities, the very concept of public space doesn't exist at all. Funny enough, uh, the square as such was introduced by Soviet planners. Yeah, as you probably know, China was or is still uh, communist country. And there was a moment when there was a very close uh, collaboration between uh, Soviet Union and uh, communist China, when Soviet Union was still there, was still existing. So in 50s uh, of, of the last century, uh, Soviet planners were pretty active in China. And then they introduced the concept of the square. Yeah. So you see, this is something very, very fresh, very, very new, that in Chinese political culture and Chinese um, in, in intellectual discourse about, about uh, urban space never existed. So the way how public space is understood by, by the public, by people, um, it's kind of different. You know? It's not really uh, related to the Western or European tradition. And these examples are uh, as showing how public space is kind of interpreted and used uh, in uh, digital media. Yeah? So this is, uh, you know, they don't really use uh, Instagram, but they have uh, similar um, uh, apps. So they are using uh, public space to, to take photographs. Yeah, to, to play with that, to transfer space into um, funny images. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, there's another example of that. So there was a, there was a mural, there was a graffiti, and then you have a, a girl who is uh, playing with, uh, with the graffiti. So again, the space is not used really for people to, to meet, uh, not uh, being public in the way that uh, the kind of European or Western architects would uh, imagine the public space should exist. It's a very personal um, kind of choreograph or kind of scenography for, for people to have some fun and to play with, with this and to kind of make use it for their own purpose, mostly you know, to present uh, what they are doing uh, online. Okay. And this, this, uh, this kind of layering of, uh, of physical space and digital presence in, uh, in China is extremely strong, it's extremely um, important. Okay, next one, please. So if uh, the public space is something that I'm, I'm not really convinced it's a, it's a great idea, or it's something that's helping us to understand uh, the urban spaces beyond uh, Europe or beyond uh, the, the Western, uh, Western world, there was another term, another concept that is extremely popular recently. It's called the common. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent uh, the discussion about the commons is, uh, uh, is present in Brazil. I, I believe that it exists in a, in a, in a very particular way. And I would like to very briefly, again, to, to criticize it. 
to talk about what the commons uh, are and then put it into the question, is it a term that uh, again will be useful for us, okay? Next slide, please. So this is the discussion about um, about the uh, of def definition of the, the, the common uh, taken from uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri book, The Commonwealth. And I will just read it. Yeah? We all share and participate in the common. By the common, we mean, first of all, the commonwealth of a material world, the air, the water, the fruit of the, the, fruit of the soil, and all natural bounties which in classic European political text is often claimed to be the inheritance of humanity as whole, to be shared together. We consider the common also, and more significantly, those results of social production that are necessary for social interaction and further production, such as knowledges, languages, codes, information, affect, and so forth. Okay? So of course, they, when they are talking about the commons, they are not talking about space as such. Uh, however, the, the discussion about the commons is adopted, is used by planners, by architects, by urbanism uh, to talk and to discuss and to produce spaces in a very similar way, like the discussion uh, coming from political theory and from philosophy, from Jürgen Habermas discussion about the public sphere was translated and transferred into space. In the same way, the commons are moved and used to talk about the, the spatial phenomena. Okay, next one. And my criticism or question about, uh, about the common is related to these two phrases that I put in, in yellow in the previous slide. So to talk about the commons, we need to produce it and reproduce it almost constantly. And uh, this is rather kind of point of reference that if you would like to, to read more, uh, the Kojin Karatani discussion about the mode of exchange, um, where he's telling a story about uh, kind of evolution of the way how humanity, how humans, how group of people were operating between themselves. You know, how the economy was moved from the economy of the gift, oh, it was kind of a gift that was expecting to, to be back, to, uh, to capitalist mode of production when you have, uh, um, you, you produce stuff, yeah? and then as a, as a commodity, you, you exchange stuff. And then this mode D is his, uh, uh, idea of what can uh, come next. But what, what is important in, uh, in Kojin Karatani thinking and how it's related to the idea of, uh, of the commons, that um, he show us how the empire or national state was more powerful. They were more powerful that uh, the organization based on tribes because tribes were exchanging stuff, but not were not able to accumulate stuff, not, not being able to accumulate, accumulate uh, agency. State and empire operate in the way that it was kind of conquer the territories, took everything from there and then redistributed to people that they believed that would be useful. Okay, the, the remnant of this is, is a taxation system. This is what, uh, how it was, yeah? So the state is, by collecting taxes, is, is accumulating ability to act, yeah? It's accumulating agency. And then when you think about the commons, then you will see that there was a no space, no moment, no opportunity to accumulate anything because the commons you need to produce and reproduce, okay? I hope it's more or less clear. Maybe it will be clear in the next uh, few slides. If you could move to the next slide, please. Okay, so I would like to, to give you an example. Uh, example 
that uh, was designed and built, uh, well, first designed and invented by my colleague, uh, Professor Doina Petrescu, who is also working in, in Sheffield University. You know, she's really established uh, uh, architect operating in, in France. So she, she lives in France and, and she, she teaches in, in Sheffield. So this is the, the project that uh, she, da, she, she has uh, done a few years ago. There was a gap, as you see on this uh, in Paris, as you see on this map, there was a gap between uh, buildings and this gap was unused. Okay, next slide, please. Hmm. Not, yeah, okay. So this is how this gap looked like. Yeah, so it's kind of unused space. And then, there was a question, what could be done uh, to make this, this space useful for, for people, okay? And the way how Doina is always working, she's using architecture, not for the sake of producing buildings, but for the sake of producing community. So space and uh, architecture production is a, is a pretext really to, to make social change. Okay, next slide. So the way how she started, she started from uh, building community or mobilizing community. People that they are living in the area, in the neighborhood nearby, uh, she invited them to brainstorm or to discuss what could happen uh, in this space and you know what they would need. And of course, you know, there's a lot of problems and, and discussion about, you know, participatory design, you know, again, who is included, who is excluded, you know, who is making final decision. Let's leave it for a moment. It's not, it's not uh, the, the key issue that I would like to talk about at that moment. Okay. But this is, this is a project that kind of aimed to produce the common, something that is shared by all people that they live in the in the neighbor. Next slide. So what they decided to build a uh, community garden. And uh, what was interesting, and it's important, I think, in this case, but also to, you know, to support my argument, they have initial money, but they knew that uh, they are not going to have this money in the future. Yeah, so there was an initial chunk of money, but uh, there's only one off that they can use. So because of that, what they are going to produce should be sustainable. It should stay and kind of allow the place and the people here to use it in the future without additional uh, funding. Okay. So because of that, they focus on uh, kind of self-sufficient uh, ecological system using water, you know, uh, food production, composting, waste, you know, this kind of stuff. Okay, next slide. So this is how it, it looked during the process that uh, local people, again, how many of them, you know, let's, let's leave this, this for, for a future. Um, they, these people engage to, to build it, to create this, uh, this place for everybody. Okay, next slide. And this is how, how it looks like. So, you know, um, it kind of doesn't matter. It never really matters for, for, for Doina. Uh, the kind of aesthetics of that, and you know, you can like it or not. You know, I like it quite, quite, quite a lot. I think that's pretty, pretty nice uh, building, but it kind of doesn't matter um, because what matters is that the community was built. So she was able by doing doing this project to mobilize residents to build it. But my question here would be. Is it still the common or it's something else? Because this building, this structure will stay and the incoming people 
so people who will move in into this district uh, new generation yeah so people who are too young to be involved in producing this they will still be able to use it yeah so they will be not involved in producing this space and creating this space but they will be able to to use it as it is and it leads me to um what i think this project really is and that's why what i think is uh, is a term that i would like to rec reclaim and introduce back to the discussion about urban spaces okay next slide please So the term that I would like to reintroduce or, or discuss is, is infrastructure. And if the, the, the public space could be seen, if, if you'd like to transfer it into um, kind of political term, could be seen as a kind of proto-democratic space, then the commons uh, are very popular amongst uh, people who are interested in the kind of more anarchic uh, ways of organizing the society, deliberative uh, democracy, or more this kind of bottom-up uh, type of, of organizing society. Infrastructure, in my, in my view, in my opinion, is kind of type of, uh, of liberal democracy. And to some extent, I would like to, to defend it. Yeah, even if you know uh, it could be controversial, but I would like to to do this. And as you as you see, or as as I hope that you will see in the second, what I believe that the, the success of of Doina's project is that it's not the commons that she created, but she created piece of infrastructure. Okay, next slide, please. Just a definition: of What infrastructure is? It's you know just just from the from the dictionary. So the the infrastructure is a system of public works of a country of a country, state, or region, resources required for an activity. Yeah. So this is something that's a supporting act activity. The second definition is very 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 similar. The underlying foundation of basic framework as a system of organization. The third we can we can skip. Okay. Next slide, please. This is uh, this is project that um, uh, if you look closely, you can you can see uh, me on this uh, this photo, and uh, it's interesting because it's, um, it's a space uh, used by anarchists in Poland. So again, um, something that looks as um, uh, closer to the commons, I would say that's a piece of um, of infrastructure because they use existing buildings to kind of support their own activity. The next slide, and they created uh, the, the the social center, and part of that was uh, the the cafe where they providing food for free, you know, like this kind of typical ways how anarchist communities are operating. But again, it wouldn't be possible if this space didn't exist. Yeah? So this space was created before they were able to, to use it. And even further, the, there is a kind of social infrastructure supporting them to, to operate. Yeah? The money were coming from somewhere. The food was coming from somewhere. You know, the labor was coming from somewhere. And this is, you know, I'm not, I'm not questioning, uh, of course, what they have been doing. I'm not trying to diminish them. I'm just trying to show that there was a material um, conditions and structure supporting what they have been doing. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay. So this is um, Kuala Lumpur, um, and um, this is um, infrastructure kind of done by people. So 
This is the project of bicycle map project. Yeah, so there is a city existing in, uh, you know, you know, built by by the state by by private uh, companies, um, and then a group of people decided to to hack the system, and to to see if they can use spaces that they were designed for something else as a, as a bicycle route. Okay. And then they created this guidelines, uh, how you can safely use spaces by cycling, the spaces that were not designed to, to, be, uh, to be used in that way, okay? So again, the same mechanism. There was a something, there was a physical uh, structure that exists, and then it's used uh, as a spin boat to, 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 to do something else. The next slide. Next slide, please. So this is uh, because it was pretty successful project uh, with um, kind of a lot of people now too, too quickly. So if you could come back to the previous one. Just, just one, one back. This is New York, and you know I would, would like to to stay in in Kuala Lumpur just for for a few more seconds. Okay, so this is this is what uh, what the local government decide to do. Yeah. Um, so this is the project that was done by people, and then because it was successful, it was used by people. There was uh, uh, interest uh, from uh, local media class and from media. Then the, gov the local government decided to um, kind of put it into, um, into their own activities. And then they created what you can see on the next slide, which is this kind of wheel type of, of, of cycle or, or bike, bike route. Okay, now we can, we can jump two slides. Okay, next slide, please. I can, I can use this time to drink my tea. Okay, so we can stay here. Um, so of course, infrastructure, uh, no, 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 too quickly. Please, one, one slide back. So infrastructure could be dangerous. Um, infrastructure is never neutral. You know, space is never neutral. This is what uh, I started my, my, my discussion, my lecture today from the, from the statement that space is never neutral. This is New York uh, with a very famous planner, Robert Moses, um, who was responsible for all this massive infrastructure project in New York. And if, you, uh, if you're familiar with name Jane Jacobs, then Jane Jacobs was uh, his uh, nemesis. You know, she was fighting against him. Yeah, that uh, he was this kind of top-down guy who was uh, making massive uh, project, and uh, Jane Jane Jacobs was defending bottom-up uh, uh, activities, communities, local local communities, and so on. Okay, um, and uh, this is this is just an example how infrastructure could be used to to hurt people. Okay, so. And of course, there was a discussion if he did it in purpose or it just happened. But we know from his private uh, correspondence and, and other sources that he was racist as a person. So I think it's a very likely that uh, he did it in purpose. And what he did here, he created this underpasses um, leading to the beach, uh, to John's beach in the way that uh, public transport buses were not able to get there. They were just too low, okay? So you can get to the beach if you have a car. So it means that you are middle class, but you can't get there if you are poor. Uh, and uh, in that time in New York, uh, poor means black or Latino, okay? So this is the, the, the very good, uh, or terrifying example of uh, this political element 
and definitely exclusive element of infrastructure. Okay, next slide, please. And then there's another example of kind of mixing or combining the, the left wing thinking about the commons so the kind of mobilization of the community with uh, more kind of top uh, top down uh, more kind of infrastructure projects this is barcelona and this is interesting because um, as you maybe know in barcelona for the the second uh, second uh, term the, the mayor of Barcelona is coming from uh, this uh, left wing, um, bottom up uh, local residents organization. Okay, so this is very interesting uh, case when uh, this um, bottom up movement, they grab the power. So they are able to act in the city from both directions. So they, they can still mobilize to, to achieve local goals from you know, local mobilization. But in the same moment, they have power to support this project uh, you know, on a municipal level. And this is, uh, the, the, the Barcelona is um, becoming famous as a, as a fab, fab, fab lab city. Um, and this is, this is one district when they are trying to to create as this almost kind of self-sufficient uh, place where different actors are supporting each other, are kind of not using, not producing waste by, but using uh, them for, you know, food production, energy production, material recycling, and all of this, this sort of stuff. So all of these ideas around the so-called circular economy, this is what, what they are testing in this. Okay, so this is this connection, this kind of combination of uh, material and social and political structure or infrastructure, as I would call, and this bottom-up mobilization. Next slide, please. Very briefly, this is just, you know, uh, very famous. I'm, I'm not sure if these uh, examples are still relevant, if they are still successful. But uh, in the beginning of 21st century, you know, there's a, you know, a lot of hype about this uh, urban think tank uh, vertical spot hall produced in, uh, in built in, in, uh, in Caracas, okay? Which again, top-down project to mobilize the local community. Okay, um, we can move uh, quickly. Next slide. Yeah, and then we can we can move to the next one. Okay, so now I would like to um, to move to 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 my criticism of um, of a public space as a Western concept, and I would like to use uh, as example as a case project that uh, research project that we have done in uh, again Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. Okay. So next slide, please. So this is this is this part of the lecture is based on on work done with my colleagues. So there's an article published uh, together with with Asma Nissan, and there was book uh, produced together with Ma Asma and and Marek as well. Next slide, please. So. The project, the, the discussion that uh, was started in, in Kuala Lumpur started from the failure. So um, in 2016, uh, I went to Kuala Lumpur with this Western vision of public space that uh, I was interested to observe how public space works in uh, multi-religion, multi-ethnic uh, community. And uh, Malaysia is a country where majority of uh, residents are Malay and Muslim. 
but there, there are two big uh, minority groups. One is Chinese, which is about 30%, and Chinese are or Buddhist or Christian, or they uh, believe in so-called traditional Chinese religions. And there was a smaller minority, but also significant. It's about 7%, between 7 and 10, the Indians, okay, which are Hindu, mostly Hindu. So when, when we went uh, for the first time, I was hoping to observe how these different communities are using the space and how they interact, you know, kind of uh, meet each other. And then it was absolutely disaster. It was absolutely failure because nothing like this happened. Yeah. So we observed that uh, group of people clearly coming from different ethnic groups are are present in in the public space or in urban spaces, but we never observed how this act of creating the the, the community, the group, happened. People were not trying to, to talk to each other in, in public. And from this, from this failure, um, we start to discuss the very specific elements of uh, how the space is used. And we start to discuss the, the issue of dating. Yeah? So how people date. So this is kind of starting point for us to, to talk about the publicness of, of the space. And in Malaysia, between Muslims, um, they don't really, they are not really allowed to, to date. And uh, it's, uh, it's forbidden to uh, two people from opposite sexes, if they are not related, so if they're not uh, brother, sister, or cousin, or husband and wife, and if they are in something what is called dangerous proximity or suspicious proximity. Yeah, so for example, holding hands is, uh, is definitely suspicious. Uh, being in a cinema and sitting you know, uh, close to each other because it's dark, so you know, it's different, different things could happen apart of watching, watching movie. So this is also suspicious proximity. So of course, it makes dating in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur for, uh, for, for, for Muslims very difficult. But it also means that the way how space is used will be different. Okay, next slide. So just to, to show you where uh, Malaysia is, if you're not uh, familiar, so you see it's like <laughs> between India and Australia. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's on, on, uh, on the island and on the peninsula. It's close to, to Singapore. Yeah, if, if it makes uh, your, your life easy. Okay, next slide, please. So it was interesting that uh, when we talk, when we discuss uh, and interview people, and many of people that we interview are um, because of the way how we are able to approach them, they were educated in the, in the West, in the UK, in Australia, in States. Many of these people were also architects or related to architecture. And then when we asked them what is public space in Kuala Lumpur, even architects were not really able to answer this question. They were kind of um, trying to give us the best example. And you know, the best example they, they, they said is a restaurant. And again, it's, I think it's interesting because in restaurants uh, in the Western narrative, uh, you know, it's a, it's a private space, you know, it's a, it's a commercial space that you, you buy food. It's not public space. You need to pay to, to enter there. So, you know, you know my, my British students probably would never call a restaurant as a public space. You know, public space is a square or it's a park, but not a restaurant. But in, in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, this is the most come, common answer. Next, next slide, please. And this is kind of uh, supporting what, what I already said. If you look closely on this, this photograph, uh, this is places where people eat uh, and food in Malaysia is amazing, by the way. So, you know, if, if you have an occasion to go there, I strongly recommend you. But if you look closely, you see that there was an almost no example of uh, people 
from different ethnic groups to sit together, okay? So even in these places, they kind of tend to, uh, to be segregated. It's not 100% rule because as I said, we have been observing a group of uh, colleagues, colleagues from work, students, that they, they came to, um, to, to the restaurant together. But they are more kind of lunch meetings or the places, the, the moments when they, they are related to what they do, um, you know, professionally. It's almost impossible to, to observe people from different ethnic uh, groups uh, to be in a more kind of private, private setting. Okay, next one. So this is this is what uh, what we what we discuss with them, and we are trying to understand what the, the public means. And again, I will I will read the last uh, the fragment of the of the interview. So there was a female interview uh, who said, "By the public, I mean that the commoner like me can enter." Of course, you know she was not really a commoner, but you know let's leave it like that. Usually it's an open area or an enclosed area where people can see what we are doing visibly. I do not think places like KTV, I don't know if you know what KTV is, it's a karaoke, karaoke club or clubs are public spaces. And then there was our question just to, to, to make sure because she said about visibility. Yeah? So you said that you want to be seen. Can you explain why? Because you know, for us, for me, it's not really related. You know, why you need to be seen to be in public space. And then uh, she was very sur surprised. She said, isn't that obvious? I hang out with my friends and I, I don't really want to go to some private spaces because it feels uncomfortable. And again, um, for someone who is not prepared, someone coming from, from Europe, this answer doesn't really answer anything. You know, it's probably even more confusing. I'm, 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 I'm kind of guessing that it could be even more confusing uh, to you. But if you put it in the context of um, Malaysian or Muslim culture of this, uh, um, how dating is, is problematic, then you will, you will understand that the fact that you are visible, that people can see that you are not in this dangerous proximity, not in this suspicious proximity, it's good, okay? So the main way how the publicness is defined is not defined in the way how we would do this in the West as a void between personal and, and the state or as a place uh, that uh, with accessibility, but the place where you can be seen by other people, okay? So I hope that you see what, uh, where, where I'm heading here. Yeah? So there's a completely different way of thinking about public space. On top of that, you also have, uh, you know, climatic issues. Yeah? So uh, there was a very humid, very, very hot uh, uh, place, Kuala Lumpur. So for example, being in the park, um, yeah, it's mostly place for, you know, kind of uh, white tourists that, uh, you know, they, they can sit in the, in the sun, not being aware how dangerous it is, okay? But, you know, so discussion about public space, when it's put in Kuala Lumpur, because of climate, because of religion, because of culture, becomes something completely different to what we had in uh, Sheffield or in, uh, I don't know, Krakow or London or whatever. Okay, the next one. Also, uh, if you, in a similar way, like uh, what I said about China, that uh, the term public space is very, very new, very fresh in China, in Muslim tradition, the distinction between private and public also doesn't exist. So in this intellectual tradition, it's something alien. Yeah, the way how they discuss about space is different. You know, I'm not, I, I'm, I don't have time now to, to, to go into details on that, um, but you know, just believe me that uh, it just doesn't exist. 
Yeah, so so none, neither in China, neither in uh, Malaysia, the distinction and the idea of public space was ever present. So why it's present now? Why it's used now? What is really doing? To what extent the distinction between private and public really helps us to understand what we are looking at? As I was trying to show you on this example on Kuala Lumpur, um, it's com it was completely useless. Yeah? The way how we approach the, the, the city, the urban space, through our Western lenses, trying to make this distinction, this typology, uh, we are not able to understand what we are looking at. Okay, the next one. So this is the, the end. Um, and this is just kind of opening question uh, because I'm guessing that as architecture students, uh, we, are, we are also familiar and we are using this disti distinction on pub, pri private and public space. But, you know, I'm, I'm not Brazilian. I don't know Brazil enough to be able to answer this question. But I would like to provoke you. I would like you to, to sit down for a moment and just ask yourself, is it really that uh, the distinction on public space and private space, the best way to talk about the Brazilian cities? Or maybe it should be something different. Maybe to really talk about your own city, you need your own Brazilian or Latin America or you know whatever you'd like to call it theory of urban space. But I'm arguing that uh, the Western concept of public space will do you more harm than good. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. Okay, guys, uh, let me go back to the questions. Uh, we're gonna start the questions right now. Olá, pessoal, a gente vai começar as perguntas, né, com Christos. É, vou liberar o chat aqui para vocês. Uh, o chat está liberado e tal. A gente podia começar é, com as perguntas. Alguém aí tem vontade de perguntar alguma coisa? Ficou com dúvida? É, alguma coisa? Podemos começar levantando aí as pessoas que querem interagir. I understand that it's, you know, it could be pretty uh, theoretical uh, lecture, so it's not necessarily something that you you are expected. But uh, well, no, it's okay. I think we should see the guys uh, how how the the students are. Uh, just wait for a second. Wait, lecture. Okay. Well, the the one one good thing that we can start discuss, uh, a discussion about Christoph is uh, the values of how do you say the theory of Western urban uh, planning theories and how it affects Brazil. Uh, we have like uh, in, in here we in Belo Horizonte is a city with. I don't know about 120 years. Uh, it's a recent, a recent city, a new city was designed to be a capital of the state of Minas Gerais, and we still have problems with the managing, I guess, of public space. Uh, how public space is used? Uh, we have the the conditions. Uh, how the, the the population relates to the the public space, it's diffuse, like social social classes uh, use it in different ways. 
we have this, uh, how do you say, how I can say it like this, classes, social classes, like a really rich, really medium classes and really poor. And how it, the relation with public space is kind of defined by, I don't know how much you earn, basically. You can, you can think like populations uh, who have more poverty, who are in, uh, more poverty, uh, more, are more close to poverty, use it, the infrastructure of the city depends of, of it much more. And the, how, how much more richer you are, you are independent of this infrastructure and your quality of life goes up. And this creates like a cycle, I guess. Uh, the investment needs to be in people, and we can see that in, for poor people, this investment that don't, don't come. And I guess the theory, uh, every, every time that I read about uh, urbanism here, it's related to this reality, and it's a reality that comes with uh, our, our history and our, our colonization. I guess uh, it goes uh, kind of, of this way. Uh, you kind of know our reality. I, I think you've been here. What do you think about uh, Belo Horizonte and this discussion that you have in here in WFMG, também, when you came and visit Puki and WFMG? What, what do you think would be a good starting point to talk about? Well, you know, I, I was in, in Belo Horizonte, um, you know, in those few weeks, really. Um, so of course, you know, I, I don't really know the city. And also the way how I explored the city was, you know, kind of white uh, middle class uh, Western tourists, okay? So yeah. the, the way that the, the, the city that I know, it's really the, the city center. Yeah? So, so there's a place that's kind of around uh, the, the university and, and the places like that. So. So it's not um, that uh, I know what is behind. We have been, because we have been doing uh, the, the, the project that I'm doing at that moment. So we have been in occupied territories um, too. Um, and you know, it, it's also a question, you know, if you put uh, this two type of, uh, of urban settings um, together, yeah, you can, you can put a uh, space that was uh, constructed by, by residents, the kind of yes. occupied, uh, Territory, and then you you put uh, the the space uh, that uh, exists uh, as a as you said effect of colonization, the kind of uh, more kind of middle class way of, of building a city. Uh, it would be you know extremely interesting. I'm, I'm pretty sure you you have been doing or someone was doing this this kind of uh, comparison, this kind of uh, uh, research. But you know, to me, it's it's fascinating that probably the language how you start talk about the spaces will be different. Yeah, there's, uh, there's kind of different uh, urban phenomenon. If, if I can just um, have a five second break because uh, it's, as you see, it's dark here. So I just okay. switch, uh, yes. switch on the light. Okay, so just give okay. me a second. Okay. Oi, pessoal, uh, vamos aqui organizar a ordem, então, enquanto o, o Christoph dá uma ligada na luz ali na casa dele, porque já está um pouco mais escuro lá. É, tem Sofia Ventura, Bernardo Virgílio e a Cássia Soares, propondo uma discussão. Essa é as ordens aqui até agora. Bom, Sofia, você quer ligar a câmera e o microfone para fazer uma pergunta aqui? Eu posso traduzir, se você quiser. Christoph, uh, a student vows. Uh, okay. So that, that, was a, that was a question that I can read here. Yes. Uh, so I would like to ask to provoke a discussion about if Brazilian urban is getting. Okay. Sofia, tá, tá liberado para você ligar. Uh, okay. Uh, oi, André. Oi. Tá. Então, ah, tá laranja. É, pois é, esquisito. Enfim. Hum. Uh, hi, Christopher. Nice to meet you. My name is Sofia. I'm from Puki, from the Praça da Liberdade. And the thing I would like to ask you is that currently we are, I mean, I would like to 
to think like if we have a partnership between the the prefecture, I don't know how to say that in English, I forgot that, uh, the municipal government, that's what I mean, and the private uh, system, a empresa privada, André, como que eu digo? Section, a private section, private, private developers. Section. Yes, some kind of partnership that would like to benefit uh, urban structure itself, uh, I would like to uh, to ask you what do you think about it, and I personally think it's a good partnership, and it we it would be beneficial for poverty poverty in general, and that's what I would like to ask you. Hi, Christopher. I think you're muted. Yes. Okay. Yes, now. André, o áudio do tradutor está mudo também. Opa, peraí. Ok, can I answer? Hmm. Ok, go ahead. Ok, so, I'm always very suspicious about uh, public-private uh, collaboration. And um, I, I will try to tell you why I think uh, it's... Uh, I'm not saying don't do this. I'm just saying be very, very careful. Because... Um, there's just different logic, okay? So the, the logic of public body is uh, a kind of as ideal logic is to serve the people. More cynical logic is to be elected, okay? So the way how public body operates um, is, uh, is different to private body that is mostly interested in profit, okay? So you have two logics of two bodies, two institutions, that they try to achieve something together. Yeah? So private company is trying to generate profit or create conditions to generate profit. Public bodies, as I said, in this more kind of idealistic point of view, is just you know trying to provide a service to people to make people happy. Uh, in a more cynical way, it's you know trying to have public support uh, to to be re elected. But these two logic. Um, are very often contradictory. They are not necessarily uh, operating uh, in, in sync. And uh, very often the private body is uh, much stronger, much more aggressive. It's also, you know, very easy to corrupt uh, the, the, the local government. Yeah? So, so there's, a, there's a tools that, uh, that private bodies uh, have to achieve something that is good for them, but it's not necessarily good for, for people. So as I said, it, I'm not saying just don't do this, um, but uh, I, am, I think that it should be extremely transparent and uh, it should be brutal in this uh, kind of honesty. Yeah? So um, you should demand honesty, why you are doing this, what you are going to get out of this, and then maybe. But examples mm -hmm. from the UK, for example, when uh, this, uh, you know, UK is a you know, pretty capitalist country, is a very strong um, participation of, of private, uh, private uh, sector. Um, it's, they are not really enthusiastic. Yeah? So the, the, the logic of generating profit um, is dominant. And then it kind of excludes people that, uh, well, people just can't uh, bring the, the money enough. And especially if you have relatively um, segregated society, if there's a big chunk of people that they are poor, then, you know, from business point of view, you know, I don't care about these people. You know? They are useless. Yeah? They are not bringing money to me. Yeah? Okay. So this is, this is little my, my response to this. Okay. Bernardo, uh, you said you had... You have a question, Bernardo? Você tem uma pergunta? Tem, tenho sim. Está me escutando? Tudo bom? Boa tarde. Tá. Uh, hi, Christopher. Uh, so, uh, I'm just I'd like to ask. You, I don't really right know if I really understand your lecture, but I just check if the, your main point is like yeah, your idea is involved the, the the community in the building of spaces and reconstruction and things like that it's the more important like i pointed to the bottom top in 
network structure, it's better for the the the, the, the society, the, the city in the general. It's a little more like something like that, right? Um, not not necessarily. I'm you know I, again I'm I was rather trying to to question the very idea of public space and suggest the different ways of thinking about the, the urban space. Um, and then this is the reason why, why I was talking about, for example, the commons. Yeah? So then the space which the main purpose is to build community, yeah? to create connection between, between uh, people that they are living in the territory. And then I was talking about the, the infrastructure as a physical and social structure that they are supporting people to achieve their own goals, to do something. Okay. So it's rather um, attempt to see what space is doing yeah, and what uh, architecture buildings, artifacts are doing, not necessarily to, to discuss um, what they are. Yeah? So I was not so much focusing on uh, trying to define what public space is, but rather was trying to ask what is the consequences of uh, taking particular approach, particular definition? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if this is uh, uh, kind of too con confusing. Does it make sense what, uh, what I'm saying? Yeah, well, it, it, it makes sense. I just like to, to understand more because I'm kind of confused at some points, but not, not about the general idea. It's more my ideas and thing that it's thinking about but i think i, I get it it's like the the architecture it's more than just the space of, of something like that the idea to need you to understand the the, the usability and all the things project the community yes okay yeah. okay thank you. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you thank you i'm Hello. sorry about the english it's not <laughs> Not, not the one to uh, to comment on anybody English, as you as you probably guess from my from my name. English is not my first language, and I'm I'm making really horrible grammar mistakes. But well, as as long as you can understand me, it's fine. So it's just a tool to communicate. So don't worry about English. Bom, uh, na, agora a gente tem uma pergunta da Cássia, que é essa que está aí, uh, provocation. It provoke a discussion. Brazilian urbanism is getting closer to Western ways of using public space because of violence, for example. Also, it was a valuable lecture. You know. The relationship with violence and this public space and, and, and this new interpretation that you propose, how do you see it? Uh, violence in here is, you see, it's a point of conflict. <laughs> We are constantly in contact with it. This, this is a brilliant question. Yeah, I, I think that it's a really, really uh, interesting point, point of view. Because um, again, from my perspective, you know, living in a relatively safe uh, city, um, I would never really think about violence as an element uh, that um, would be central to discussion about public space. Of course, we are taking this into consideration. You know, the police produce maps uh, that showing uh, crimes that is happening in different different places. Mm -hmm. But then there was a, you know there's a question how you define crime. Um, there was a, two years ago my there, there was a something called antisocial behavior uh, in the in the UK in in British law. Uh, but antisocial behavior could be you know drinking publicly or you know um, you know, different, different things in different, different places. And this is definitely the, the way to exclude, you know, some, some group of people from, from the space. Yeah? So this is, this is the level of uh, violence, um, kind of oppression or, or legal issue that um, in Sheffield, London, or UK, we, we kind of take into consideration. But um, I'm, I'm guessing that your question is much more serious. Yeah? So when, when you talk about violence, you are talking about you know, serious violence, about riots, about killing. Um, and I don't have an answer, to be honest. You know? I think that this is a really interesting question. And this is something that um, probably, you know, it kind of going back to, to my last uh, 
slides and kind of uh, invitation for you to to think about it. Uh, I would I would say that uh, I would kind of encourage you to think about uh, urban space from the perspective of security and violence. The risk, of course, is that then you can start to accept this because um, the example that I was I was uh, giving about defensible space theory, uh, it's also used by our British police as a kind of manual tool to um, provide security by design. Okay, so when when you when you design anything. Uh, the kind of master planning, police is looking on your project and the kind of making sure that um, there's a no kind of uh, weird corners that nobody can see. Yeah, so there's this element of a community controlling the space is included in your design. Okay, so to in in that sense, violence or crime is uh, is taken into consideration also also in the UK. But then, as I said, it's the, the risk is that there was a, some kind of normalization of, uh, of violence. You kind of accept it, and then you kind of uh, all think how you can uh, change it by design, which in fact means that you try to push it beyond uh, this space that you control that, that you can see. But so I don't really have good answer to that. I think that this is a really brilliant question. You know, and uh, definitely, you know, I would like to discuss and think first about this uh, this further maybe when i when i join you in in belo horizonte yes é caso você quiser falar alguma coisa fica à vontade viu pode me interromper a hora que você quiser proposta foi muito legal a lohane felix também ela ela uh, she quotes like a, a, one of her experiences that she was able to visit new york city and the relationship with public space in here is much more connected with poor people in the presence of poor people here and in there it's she, she felt more community different people different uh how do you say different prospects a more com communal way uh, of using the for instance domino parking in brooklyn for instance uh it, and again i i think it's uh an, an example of how we can uh, resilience relate to public space in here in Belo Horizonte and in other cities. Uh, the relationship with poverty and fear, I guess. Yeah, I think in a in a in a, in a partly it's related to to the to the first question, to the previous question, the question asked by by Kasia, uh, that um, if you feel safe in the in the place in, in in the city then you feel more comfortable to go there with kids yeah, to play to just to enjoy yourself yeah when you feel um stressed you know or you know in danger then of course it's not you know as an anecdote i i remember that um uh you know I spent some time in Brazil, and then when I came back to to Sheffield, it took me about two or three weeks to uh, start back using my mobile phone in public. Yeah, because in, when I was in Brazil, everybody was telling me just don't do this, and just you know just absolutely don't don't use your your, your mobile phone in, in public, which uh, you know it, it was never my concern in the in the UK. It's you know it's uh, it's not happening that someone is just you know uh, rob you. Yeah, so so this is this is very very different. Um, but I have one comment on that that is probably not really helping you. But um, I think that we should be also very careful to not kind of under overestimate what we can do as architects. Yeah, so this uh, design, you know, against crime, all these kind of issues. Um, I'm always kind of feel uncomfortable about this because um, it's not really our job to be honest yeah we can't unfortunately as uh, as professionals we can't really make the change you know to to, to make the, the world better this is what we should achieve as a society so we as architects we should be citizens you know, we should be voting for people 
and, and supporting people, that they are providing more equal, more just uh, society, that you feel just safe. You know, you feel safe to go with, with kids and, you know, to use the fountain. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that this is, this is a very difficult question because um, there, was, there was a risk of uh, kind of designing this island of, of safety, kind of gated communities, you know, kind of places where you feel safe because you are among people like like you. And you know, I'm not, I'm not again, I'm not trying to blame people that they don't feel like that because you know, mm -hmm. again, I'm talking to you from extremely privileged position. Yeah, I you know, I was robbed once in my in my life, but uh, only because I look German. Yeah, and I was uh, I was in Lis Lisbon, in Lisboa, and I, I look German, so German tourists are rich. So you know, then people you know try to take advantage of me. Yeah, but you know, in, apart from that, you know, I never had experience like like this. So so because of that, uh, I think that um, I I think. I feel kind of reluctant and uncomfortable really to to preach you about you know how, how you should think about about faith I, I think that this is really up to you yes well the way uh, since we are in a, in a architecture school like architecture in urban school one of the main i guess provocations that we can do with our students is how to well create a, a culture of proposing different spaces in, I don't know, uh, classes of project and production and proposal, that uh, in, through this experience of, of, of education, uh, deal with this fear, I guess. Uh, when you start being around uh, groups, uh, these community groups, working with them, uh, you have a sense of community and you feel more secure in these places when you, you, you have more connection with people and you have more trading, I guess. Social social trading. It's it's I, I my experience in England you can see like different groups are always gathering in public spaces. In here we have it too as well. Different groups working in public spaces, uh, political groups working in public spaces. And there is like a sense, uh, different uh, left-wing uh, left -wing politicians always say that like, people who are engaged in social and political movements, they, they have a sense of more security and more belonging, I guess. And there's this well, discussion, I, I guess. I, I would definitely support um, you know, architecture school being a place of speculation. I think this is important uh, for us to imagine better world. And imagine how this better world could look like. And yes. by working, and I know that this, this is very, very typical for Brazilian School of Architecture, that you engage with community, you work with, with, with community. So you are not uh, uh, exist in this kind of ivory tower, but you, you try to engage with the world outside this. So I think that this is a kind of probably the, the try to achieve the balance on one hand to respond to direct uh, needs of communities that we are working with. But in the same moment, to try to design for hope, yeah, to kind of try to imagine what, you know, what what it means to what could what should happen to make the world uh, the, the better place, safer place, a place that we we all should should welcome and include. It. I see there is another question here in the yes. chat uh, from from Naila, so I can read it and then answer. Hi, Krzysztof, I would like to know what do you think about the pandemic situation? Do you think there will be a new way of using public spaces? This is a very good question. Um, and well, uh, I was I have been asked about this, you know, till the, the pandemic started and I'm asking this, this myself. So, of course, the question is how long uh, the situation will stay. OK, so I'm personally uh, kind of pessimistic in the sense that um, I'm not 100% convinced that we'll have vaccine in the next couple of months, okay? I think that everybody is trying to do, but, um, you know, for, for SARS, which uh, was the kind of previous version of the virus, the vaccine was never produced. Yeah, it was just difficult to do this. Uh, for HIV, vaccine doesn't exist so i wouldn't be 
too optimistic that we'll get a vaccine uh, quick. I think that this is what you know politicians are trying to convince us. Um, but mm, I hope they are right, but uh, I'm I'm not sure. And this is this is of course makes makes the discussion uh, much more complicated because if the vaccine or or, or medicine uh, appear relatively quickly, then there's a chance that at least partly will go back partly because I think that there's some element of what uh, <laughs> happened over the last few months will stay and I will come back to this in a second. But if the, the virus is going to stay with us for longer and uh, the pandemic will, is, is going to stay with us for longer, um, then of course there will be new way of, uh, of using public spaces. Yeah, then uh, that what is happening at that moment with this you know, spatial distancing, the certain procedures, uh, it, it will become the, the norm. It will become the way how we start to not only design new things, but also redesign um, buildings. You know, it's, uh, it's extremely interesting and you know, kind of terrifying that um, British universities, they promise uh, students that there will be face-to-face -face teaching. Um, so now we start new academic year. So our academic year is just, just started. And uh, students came and of course there was an outbreak and there was a, a no, new lockdown in Scotland in several places. It's, it's, it's absolutely disaster. But um, it's also because nobody really planned it you know, in detail. We did, okay? So in our school, we are located in the tower. Yeah, it's Sheffield, Sheffield School of Architecture is located in Art Tower. So we kind of analyze as architects should do, what it really mean if we would like to obey the regulations to have 1.5 meters uh, distance between people. And then how people are going to enter and exit the tower. Yeah? So if we are lucky, and if we are very well organized, we will need more than one hour for our students to enter the building and then to leave the building. So it's absurd. Yeah, it's nonsense. Yeah, there's there was kind of no way. And you know, I'm not talking about people that they are disabled. You know, I'm not talking people that uh, they have some health issues. Yeah, it it was just very very kind of rough calculation of uh, people kind of moving in a um, kind of average speed and you know going through all these procedures yeah so you see this is this is elements that will influence the way how how we we operate in space and then i think that some of uh, what happened already will will stay so for example i think that there will be more and more interest in working from home but again it makes uh, the, the whole discussion about home different. Yeah. So in the UK, there was a massive uh, number of apartments that they are really tiny. And then if you have two people working from home, living in the same apartment, I'm not even talking that they have kids. Uh, again, they can't do this. Yeah? So I'm I'm hoping or I'm expecting that there will be discussion, much broader discussion about uh, the quality of life, quality of spaces, quality of apartments. Um, yeah, we'll see. I, I, I think that at least some element of what happened already, what we experienced already, will remain or force us to rethink how we design. The others, it depends if uh, how long uh, pandemics will, will stay with us. Okay. Uh, we're thinking we're coming to an end. Uh, we're in our scheduled time. Uh, it's been like two hours since we started. So uh, uh, there's a, a last question, I guess we can answer. It's Lydia. She said uh, she okay. it's in the chat if you want to read it. I can read yeah. it for you as well. Yeah, okay. So the, the question is from, from Lillian, yes? So as you said, capitality is present in our city and there are many social conflicts between public spaces and users that are caused by this capitalist logic of producing cities. In my opinion and the vision as a student architect, uh, this mode of urban production in cities is inseparable from the problem of the capitalist system we live in. 
how do you suppose that we could overcome this issue of the urban in our cities caused by the model of market production if we are in inserted in this capitalist logic? It's a great question, and it's probably a question for another lecture. Um, yes. <laughs> I, it's interesting. I, I had um, just recently, I was um, giving the interview, let's say, for, for the podcast, uh, which uh, is kind of a right wing podcast with, a, you know, interest in accelerationism and, and things like that. Um, and I think what I would like to argue, I would like to argue that um, capitalism is a um, hegemonic system of hege hegemonic language allowing different economic actors to, co to communicate. But capitalism is not universal, it's not hegemonic in the sense that it's not penetrating the social body through uh, the whole. To, to explain it, the relationships that exist in your family are not capitalist. Yeah, I'm guessing that you know you you do stuff uh, for people you love because you love them, not because you are paid. The logic inside your body is not capitalist. Yeah, your body exists beyond capitalist logic. The logic of ecosystem is not capitalist. Okay, there was uh, many different economical regimes, like you know uh, more kind of experimental. Uh, like, you know, economy of gifts, uh, you know, time banks, but they are also exploitative, yeah, kind of slavery and stuff like that. They are, they are all not capitalist. But what capitalism is doing, capitalism is just giving us the, so far, the only language that this different smaller logic can communicate between each other, okay? And this is the power of capitalism. But I'm, I'm so on one hand, when you look on the city, you will see this other logic that they exist. And on local level, you can support them. You know, I, I show you the example of this uh, uh, anarchist center in, uh, in Poland. Yeah, yeah there, was, there was just gaps in the capitalist logic um, that it existed. It, is, it was even more interesting. You know, I had no time to, to go into details, but it was not occupation. They were, they got this building from the owner who had uh, some unregulated legal issue between the, the ownership of the land and ownership of the building. So for two years, he just said, you know, I can't use this building anyway, so just take it. You know, and after, after, after two years, you know, you, you just give it back, okay? So, you know, even this kind of top-down uh, logic of capital was, was possible to create this gap, this autonomous zone to create something else. Yeah? So this is what, what I would like to, to suggest you to look closely on uh, in detail, how pieces, elements of the city operate and just try to create this, what I, what I called, uh, you know, quoting uh, David Harvey, spaces of hope. I hope it helps. Yes. Great answer, Christoph. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to speak a little bit of Portuguese. Okay, pessoal, a gente está chegando aqui no, no, nos finalmente.